Okay. I got to remember to continue to let people in here. <laughs> um, so welcome to, um, this is our first Smokehouse Pilots uh, sponsored event with the FAST team. Um, and I got to say, um, it's been amazing working with uh, Bob and John and Perry throughout this process to get this first virtual meeting through Smokehouse Pilots set up. So thank you so much to you gentlemen um, for working with Chris and I and others along the way to make this happen. Um, I know we've been talking about it for quite some time, so really appreciate that. Um, also want to welcome everybody who is in the group, in the Smokehouse Pilots group. Welcome again. It's great to see some familiar faces. Um, it's also great to see some new faces. And just as a side note, uh, there are participants in this group uh, this evening that are not a part of the Smokehouse Pilots, but do participate in wings credits in, in the FAST team. So I just want to let you know that. And so welcome to the, to the meeting. Um, in addition, let's welcome everybody over on Facebook Live. Um, we've already got quite a, quite a group over there watching here. Give me just one second, letting a few people in. Um, so if I'm a little all over the place, it's because I'm trying to manage this, <laughs> this uh, entry point. Um, once we're past that, we'll be good to go. Um, <clears throat> I also wanted to say thank you as well to uh, Mark Loudermilk, Mike Schwartz. As uh, I know, we had discussed this concept as well um, just a few weeks ago to see it come to life is pretty sweet. Um, lastly, I think it's important to note that um, even though we're going through a really difficult period of time in the world, um, depending on your situation, um, I think it's great that we can all continue to connect the way that we are doing it. So thank you again for all showing up. If, we, if you didn't, this call wouldn't be possible. So the other thing that I'd like to say is um, it is a privilege having such a wide range of aviators like yourselves in our group. Um, and so I encourage everybody to take advantage of that, ask questions throughout the evening in the chat or even at the end of the presentation uh, and really engage with each other so that we can have a really good dialogue. Um, I've clearly looked at the presentation and, and I'm super excited to see it. So uh, we have the best presenting, so uh, I'm sure you'll, you'll find it valuable. Uh, so with that said, this meeting is being recorded um, and we will share this recording on our YouTube page for those that cannot attend. Um, and it will also be on Facebook clearly because it's on Facebook Live. So um, please enjoy the call. Uh, if you do have questions throughout it, put them in the chat. Um, but I will say that uh, we did max out the attendance at 300. So if you don't want to stick around, perhaps drop off so anybody else can join in after they register. So that's what I've got for this evening. Looking forward to this. And uh, with that said, I'd like to introduce Perry Benshoof with the FEA. Um, he is the program manager of the Washington FISDO who has helped us put on this uh, event this evening. So with that said, Perry, all, the, all yours. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, like Gabe said, my name is Perry Benshoff. I'm FAST team program manager for the Washington FISDO. Took over the position this past July and it's been pretty exciting and I've truly enjoyed it. Uh, thus far. I don't uh, think it's going to change anything. I think it, as far as the future goes, I think it's, everything's going to be great. And uh, like I said, the position has been super exciting, super fun. Have got the opportunity to meet and work with a lot of nice people, uh, you folks. And that's what, that's what makes the, the job so great. So I uh, appreciate uh, Gabe and Chris and John and Bob, these guys putting this on. Uh, that's what the expectation is of our FAST team representatives, is they're, they're expected to put these programs on, provide educational opportunities for the pilots. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, we say it so many times every single day here recently that this kind of has become uh, our future or, um, with, with having to stay at home and sheltering, et cetera. But the nice thing that I see from my perspective is, is that the pilots are still hungry for information. They're still hungry for educational opportunities. Even though you may not be able to go out and climb into an airplane and go out and do actual approaches, uh, even if you can't do an actual wings program where you're getting wings credit, I'm, I'm hearing over and over and over again how pilots are still reaching out, watching videos, reading, getting back into the books, and that, that's what we want to hear. Uh, that's just incredible. That just tells us that flying is in your heart and uh, you're staying on top of it. And that's the main thing is we just want, there is going to come a time when we get back to normal. And the idea and the hope is, is that uh, <laughs> have done everything that they can to, to keep their minds sharp. So when they go back out and start flying instruments, VFR, whatever it is, uh, you're still on top of your game. So uh, again, I appreciate everybody uh, 
signing up, taking the time out of your evening to, to participate in this. We are going to have more of these uh, around. Uh, I expect a bunch with Leesburg with the Smokehouse Pilot Crew. And uh, we're going to have, uh, we'll, hopefully we'll get back to normal and we'll start having uh, presentations, seminars actually at the airports themselves. So I won't take up any more time. Uh, I know there's a lot of things going on right now. We had the special VFR or special uh, FAR that came out or is coming out. Uh, it was uh, the notification came out, I think, yesterday. I think John Somiak is going to talk about that a little bit, but the information is out there on the FAA website. Uh, and they've also created, if you're familiar with FSIMS, and if you just uh, Google the letters F-S-I-M-S, -S, that will take you to a link that uh, shows you all of the guidance that we have to go by when doing our jobs. And there's a special tab on that page uh, that has all of the exemptions that have come out from the FAA pertaining to 61, 91, 135, et cetera. Everything that pertains to the COVID-19, the exemptions, et cetera, is on that page as well. So uh, I'll send it back to you and I appreciate the time. Awesome, give me just one second, Chris, before uh, you move forward. I'm gonna go ahead and mute everybody at one time and mute, unmute yourself, Chris, after this, okay? All right. All right, there you go. Everybody is now muted. So we should be good on the background noise and I'll try to monitor that throughout the night. Perfect, sounds great, thanks. Thanks, Gabe. All right, folks, welcome, uh, Gabe said, all the things about smokers and uh, how we've gotten to where we've gotten to. So I just wanted to quickly talk about the meeting itself, the flow of the meeting, uh, what we are trying to do. This is a WINGS credit uh, seminar, and hence uh, there are a few things which are going to be different from the ones that we traditionally do. So as you have already noticed, we required everyone to register for the event, and uh, we are going to monitor uh, attendance in a sense, and this is not I mean, if you have to go take a bio break, take a bio break. But uh, for the most part, we are trying to make sure that people are actually attending the event. Uh, the second important thing is also that towards the end of the presentation, there will be a quiz of sorts. Um, we'll leave it up to the, the presenters to make it easy on you guys. But uh, the responses on the quiz are a requirement to get to the WINGS credit. Uh, and if you have registered for this event with the email address that is on the fasafety.gov website, great, we will be able to directly find you. If you have registered with a different email, after the event is done, do drop us an email with your fasafety.gov uh, email so we are able to assign Wings credit for it. Uh, last couple of quick things. Number one, uh, we will be collecting questions, like Gabe said, through the chat. So as the presentation goes, we'd really appreciate everyone being on mute and uh, dropping your questions on the chat. We'll collate it and we'll have a Q&A session. And once we are done with the session, we'll kind of open it up uh, and have a like an open mic so you can talk to the presenters and others. Uh, with that, uh, can I request Tim Fisher, our local CFI from Aero Elite, to quickly introduce the speakers. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, I was asked to introduce these two guys because uh, I have known them for quite a while, um, more than more time than probably both of them would, would actually like to admit. Um, up on the screen, you'll see the slide uh, for Jim and Bob. Um, John around Leesburg Airport for, for a long time. He and I met in 2002 uh, after he became a CFI uh, in 01. And we both uh, came to AVED Flight School as, uh, as instructors. Um, former chief flight instructor at AVED, tons of flight time, and uh, is currently an FAA DPE that I know we at Aero Elite use uh, pretty extensively. Um, so uh, John's a wealth of knowledge. I can tell you I've, I've picked his brain numerous times um, on, a, on a bunch of stuff. So um, this will be a good, a good session. And then Bob, I've known for a long time too. We've been in instructors, uh, fellow instructors at Leesburg Airport. Um, pretty much has every rating you could think of. Uh, ex Air Force pilot, and uh, and mo almost most importantly, a platinum CSIP, um, and and one of the few um, here, especially around this local area. Um, so tons of flight time, just an incredible wealth of knowledge as well. He and I. Um, have uh, on numerous occasions discussed a, a wide variety of topics um, that I've that I've gotten his uh, his expertise on. So 
I think you guys are in for a real treat tonight. You got two very experienced guys um, with a ton of time as CFIs, a ton of time as, uh, as pilots. And um, I think you're in for a treat tonight, guys. So uh, with that, Krish, I will hand it back to you. Thank you, Tim. So guys, a couple of quick things again. Uh, make sure you are attending the session throughout for Wings Credit and then make sure that you are answering the polls at the end. Keep all your questions on the chat. And with that, the, the one personal touch I would add to what Tim said is uh, Bob Garrity is my instructor. He's taught me everything I know. And uh, John Sulmiak was my DPE. <laughs> and I learned a bunch from both of them. So over to you, John and Bob. I'm going back on you. Okay, great. Uh, let's uh, switch the sharing off for a moment. John, you have the screen. Okay, got it. Okay. Well, we're having a seminar. Do you have my screen up? I brought donuts yeah. for everybody. They're virtual donuts, so help yourself. If we run out, we'll just invent some more. So that's the nice thing about virtual technology. So um, thank you. Uh, Gabe and Krish, appreciate the kind words. Uh, it's a pleasure to be working with Bob on this. Bob and I go back a while too. Uh, and we have a number of good things that we want to cover today. But first of all, I want to cover a couple of new di news items uh, that everybody needs to know about. So there's a TFR going up tomorrow at 2000 Zulu over uh, Camp David. Uh, so just be cautious if you're flying around that area. The outer ring is a 10 nautical mile radius. The inner ring is the normal five nautical mile around P40. Uh, for the instructors, just make sure your people, if anyone's flying, uh, stand clear. Uh, it goes to 18,000 feet. So uh, the president will be up there. So no time to fool around. The other thing is, uh, for those of you that fly at Manassas, uh, starting on Monday, Manassas is going to a reduced power operation uh, time frame. They're going to be in operation from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, after that, it becomes a Class E non-powered airport. So I'm sure everyone who's flying out of Manassas knows that. Uh, if anyone had planned to go down to Manassas or be down that way, just be aware that uh, they are on reduced hours. Um, and it's, it's due to the... Uh, uh, the COVID-19 situation as well. Now, for anyone who's uh, doing work out of uh, Manassas, everybody gets into a groove. You're into a groove in doing everything according to tower operations protocols. Once the tower shuts off at uh, 4 p.m., you really need to think about your non-tower protocols and how to uh, make sure that you do your self-announce, how to get your squawk code and your clearances from Potomac and so on. So just revisit that uh, before you are flying uh, on your own down there. Okay, uh, and a couple of folks had mentioned this. This notice came out yesterday. It's a special federal aviation regulation, SFAR, that's coming out for regulation release relief uh, very shortly. Uh, I guess it'll be in, in effect probably next week. Just very briefly, I'm gonna to touch on the high level parts of this. As Perry had said, please go to the uh, FSIMS site. They have all the detail. AOPA has done a nice summary uh, of what these actually mean for pilots. So uh, go there for your definitive information. Basically for medicals, if you have a medical that's gonna expire between March 31st and May 31st, you get some extra time through June 30th to get that renewed. For flight reviews, they're adding a three month grace period for those who have uh, flight reviews that would expire between March 1st and June 30th. Now, it's not a, a, a freebie. You've got to log 10 hours of PIC in the last 12 months. They wanna see that you've been an active pilot. And interestingly enough, you have to complete three wings credits hours on uh, the uh, FAA safety team and FAA safety.gov. 
So any of you doing this tonight, you stay around, you can finish it off, you get WINGS credit. So that'll help you out if you need a flight review. Uh, recent flight experience for instrument currency, that's being extended by three months as well. There's some stipulations for that. Uh, you had to have logged uh, three approaches in the last six calendar months, and that goes through June 30th. Knowledge tests, they're being extended for an extra three months. And then lastly, for flight instructors, the flight instructor certificates uh, that are gonna expire between March 31st and May 31st uh, get extended to June 30th. So uh, we thank the FAA for doing that. I know the industry groups, the FAA, uh, the uh, NABA people have been lobbying to get that done and it was a huge amount of work. If you read the entire document that uh, uh, codifies this, it is a, a massive amount of work. So we thank our FAA friends for doing that for us. And with that, Chris, you can take back the screen. Do you want me back up? Yep. Okay. All right, Sid. So. All right. So next, please. Okay. All right. So here we are. Um, so why are we talking about stabilized approach? Wasn't that something that you and your private instructor and your primary training talked about? And you know, what's the big deal with that? Well, it's a pretty serious subject and it has to do with general aviation safety. Uh, back in 1997, uh, the FAA started an initiative called the Safer Skies Initiative. And they brought together industry, uh, government agencies such as FAA, NTSB, and uh, uh, training groups, including AOPA, Gamma, and others. And the goal was to improve general aviation safety, which frankly has not been as good as it should be. And it's actually remained fairly flat over the last 10 years. So we've got to help find ways to impact and to improve our safety profile in general aviation. So there is a group called the General Aviation Joint Steering Committee. And it has uh, those groups that I talked about. And they put together a, uh, a subcommittee that looked at the occurrences of loss of control accidents. And they looked at data from 2001 through 2010. And there were 180 fatal general aviation accidents that were caused by loss of control. And that's a big part of the, the bad numbers that we have in our safety profiles. So the, the working committee, the working group that was working on that, distilled all that data down and found that emphasizing a stabilized approach and making early go-round decisions should be very key in reducing our accident rates and specifically uh, landing accidents. So that's why we're doing this. Okay, next. This chart depicts the, uh, the results of that study from the, uh, uh, the study group for loss of control. And the arrow showing the number of accidents uh, that occurred in the approach phase. And that's uh, setting up uh, an approach, coming in for landing, and that's where we wanna concentrate the discussion on. Now you also notice the highest number of accidents, fatal accidents came from maneuvering flight, which is actually related to what we're talking about. So maneuvering flight is close to the ground when you're climbing, descending, or making turns. And from your prior experience and your knowledge, you know that that's where bad things can happen. Stall spin accidents, accelerated stalls and so forth. But we're gonna concentrate more so on the uh, approach segment and that's where we get our uh, emphasis on the stabilized approach. Okay, next. These are several of the uh, points that were called out by that working group 
that were contributory to loss of control. So if you would hit the next uh, entry there, there we go, okay. Uh, and what we're calling out here are some of those that are very specific to stabilized approach and what we need to do about it. So of all of these, we're gonna focus on stabilized approach, uh, inappropriate go-round procedures, or inappropriate use of the go-round and not executing go-rounds. We're gonna talk about over-reliance on automation and the lack of proper aeronautical decision-making skills. Those all go together to uh, uh, contribute to those poor numbers that we have. Okay, next please. Now, this is a, uh, a chart that uh, I borrowed from the, the deck that uh, Perry had shown to those of you that uh, uh, attended the, the open house session, the uh, forum session in Leesburg in February. This is Washington FISDO accident data. Accidents that occur here are in our backyard. And unfortunately, the highest number of those come from the landing phase of all phases of flight, 28 landing accidents. Now, I don't know which of those were fatal, if any, but it just shows that landing still is a higher risk phase of flight. And that's something we want to uh, have an, a positive impact on. Okay, so let's go next. All right, so stabilized approach. You know, again, is that just uh, CFI talk that you do when you are getting ready to go solo with your primary instructor, or does that apply to everybody? It applies to everybody, whether you're on a, a VFR in a VFR pattern or you're on an instrument approach and you're you're flying a TBM. A stabilized approach is one that you you establish an approach and you maintain a constant angle glide path down to the runway to that position that you've selected to land on. Sounds easy enough, but there are a lot of factors in it and there are a lot of complications that can mess it up. And that's what we're gonna talk about. In doing this stabilized approach, the pilot's judgment is always active. You're using visual cues you're using your knowledge of how to set up the airplane and applying all of that so that you have this constant descent at a proper airspeed, proper configuration, all the way to touchdown. Now, I will say as an instructor, I've been teaching for 18 years, this is probably the hardest thing to teach a new pilot, a stabilized approach, because there are so many variables and you're getting close to the ground and people are getting antsy. So it is a, something that a new instructor needs to learn incrementally how to, to uh, uh, convey this concept and to build those skills. Okay, next. Okay, this is a fairly simplified picture of a stabilized approach, but the key thing is it's trying to illustrate is that it's a smooth, continuous, straight approach down the, the glide path, whether it's an electronic glide path or just visual, to your point of touchdown. And it comes from the proper setup done at the proper time. And we'll talk about that as well. Let's go next slide. What this slide's trying to illustrate is an unstabilized approach. It's characterized usually by a choppy um, and abrupt set of uh, transitions from one uh, mode of flight to another, maybe leveling off, putting the nose down for a steep descent, and it's not smooth and re results in some very unfortunate things that can happen at the end. And we'll talk about uh, some of those contributing factors, but the end result that, that can come from an unstabilized approach can include the four bad types of landings that you probably all learned about on your, uh, your private certificate, and that is ballooning, uh, wheelbarrowing, bouncing, and porpoising, all heavily contributed to by an unstabilized approach. And at least when I teach it, if any of my students had uh, any of those four of the bad types of landings starting to be initial, uh, uh, 
experience, you must go around. You never ever try to save a balloon, a bounce, a, a wheelbarrow, or a porpoise landing ever. You end up with some bent airplanes if you try to do that. So next slide. All right, so as I said a little bit earlier, this concept applies to both instrument approaches and VFR approaches. And in fact, some people might think, well, that's probably more an instrument thing because you have to be more precise on your instrument approach. Well, possibly, but it does apply to VFR flights as well. So let's go to the next slide and we'll look at the IFR uh, profile of what we have to do with this. So the guidance from uh, the FAA and the industry is that you need to be stabilized by a thousand feet above the touchdown elevation. On an IFR approach, that's usually a little bit before your uh, final approach fix. And basically, you, you want to start getting this set up and stabilized on an instrument approach, probably somewhere around an intermediate fix, getting things sorted out so that when you come to the final approach fix and you start your final descent, you're in good shape. And by that, we mean you have the correct uh, uh, flight path and using very small corrections to maintain that flight path. Before the final approach fix, no more than 10 degrees of heading change. After the final approach fix inbound, no more than five degrees. It's all very finessed. Your power has been set appropriately uh, for the position of where you are on the approach and the configuration that you're in. I know Bob's gonna talk about that a little bit later as well. Your power setting is a key predictor of how that approach is gonna turn out. If you're, you've not set your power appropriately or in the proper time frame it gets pretty ragged and that you're on speed. So if the power is set properly, the configuration is set properly, predicting the outcome of, of what the airplane's gonna do is fairly straightforward and you should be on speed. No more than 10 above, no more than five below your target airspeed. And your descent is, if you're on an IFR approach, on the glide slope or glide path, electronic, or if you've broken out into VMC, you're on a VASI or a PAPI, and that brings you down to your touchdown point. And hopefully you're doing this around 500 feet per minute or less. Uh, now, there are some approaches where you might have to have a steeper approach, perhaps a non-precision approach that's a little bit of a slam dunk, but you're shooting for somewhere in the 500 foot per minute range. And you've also assessed the wind and you've corrected for it. We'll talk more about that a little bit uh, coming up here and you're in the landing configuration, and hopefully you've done your landing checklist well before the final approach fix. Okay, next. Okay, VFR approaches. Now, the, uh, uh, the advice is to get it stabilized by about 500 feet before touchdown. You get a little more time, because the assumption is that you now have visual cues you can see the runway and you're now able to make a little bit better adjustments so you can go a little bit lower. But the same process applies. It's the same steps that you go through, correcting your path, setting your power, getting the resultant speed that you, you desire and need, and you're on a descent path. Now, if you're in visual conditions, you can use the VASI or PAPI if one is available. Even if you're in visual conditions and electronic means are available and you're instrument rated, why not put in a, a glide slope or a glide path and follow that as well? That's gonna hopefully give you that 500 foot per minute descent rate. Winds has been assessed and corrected for and so forth. So 1,000 feet for instrument approaches, 500 feet as your target for VFR approaches. If you are not stabilized by that point, you go around. And we're going to talk more about that as well. Okay, next chart. Okay, crosswind. Um, I added this chart from another stabilized approach presentation because wind is the thing, the big variable that is going to change from flight to flight, from hour to hour in anybody's uh, flight. It's what you're going to experience as you go from in route down to pattern and down to the final approach. The wind velocity will change, the wind direction will change, and you have to be able to manage that. So um, 
we don't particularly care how you do your correction for your crosswind, whether you use the side slip or the crab method. I know when, we, when I do uh, check rides, if you show proficiency in doing either of those methods and it gives a good result, that's great. We don't particularly uh, ascribe one method or the other. We just want a good result at the end. But uh, anytime that your aircraft is not sta stabilized because the wind has changed, the, the, the wind speed has, has differed and it's now put you out of whack, you cannot continue with that approach. You need, really need to go around. Okay, next slide. Okay, I also feel compelled to, to remind everyone that when you're, you're coming for a check ride, whether it's a, a private, a commercial, or an instrument check ride, uh, knowledge and being aware of what a stabilized approach is, is something that we expect. That's written and now infused into the ACS for private, commercial, and yes, it is also in the instrument check ride ACS. So for instructors, you need to uh, ensure that your applicants are aware of the concept of the stabilized approach, how to manage the energy of the airplane so that they have a successful outcome. Um, okay, next one. Okay, so where do you get most of your guidance on how to set this up? Well, the first point of reference is the pilot's operating handbook for the airplane that you fly. It's gonna have a description of what the takeoff profile looks like, the climb, the cruise, and then the descent, and then often, most often, the, the manufacturer will also describe the uh, descent and transition to landing for normal landings for short field and soft field. Some manufacturers may or may not put those last two in there. But those are your, your key things that it's gonna tell you how to configure the airplane, the speed that you're looking for, and how to set your power. And your instructors, hopefully, have uh, reinforced that and brought you up to speed on that. Now also there's additional manufacturer guidance that may be available. I'll point out that Cirrus has a very good landing course that was put out several years ago uh, in response to a number of issues that had come up uh, with Cirrus pilots landing their planes too flat, not enough uh, uh, landing attitude and causing damage to their airplanes. And that is a very helpful course. Bob, do you have any input on that? Yeah, I'm unmute here. Yeah, I would just say that um, Cirrus has a great resource that could be used for other airplanes as well called the IFOM. It's an interactive flight operations manual. And I think on your next screen, it'll show an example of, of um, how they lay it out sort of almost scientifically so you know what the power setting is going to be to give you the right speed on downwind and you really don't change the power you control the rest of it with when you put in the flaps and it just kind of just makes a stabilized approach almost automatic if you if you follow the power settings and um and procedures that you that you see in the farm in the iphone okay good thank you so, bob sure um it this is very formulaic so we'll get to that in just a moment but you're also gonna be consulting your performance charts. You're gonna know your speeds for safe operation, obviously your emergency procedures. But I'll also recommend, in addition to your other FAA uh, references that you have, some years ago, the FAA put together a very informative set of brochures called On Landing. And there were three separate versions of that, one, two, and three, and they, they went through various phases and facets of the landing process. And I, I still think they're very, very valuable. So if you just uh, Google on FAA on landings, you'll find them on the FAA website. They're PDFs, you can download them. They're very informative for new pilots and pilots in training, but also for seasoned pilots. It's a nice refresher on uh, the whole process and things maybe you had uh, not talked about for a while. Okay, next please. So, a question I get from, have gotten from uh, primary students is where does this stabilized approach start? Is it at the top of final? 
where does it start? Well, it really starts in the pattern. If you're, if you're doing a VFR pattern, it starts on downwind. You do not want to be behind the airplane. We've all heard that expression, and it definitely applies to this subject matter. So uh, this happens to be a chart from uh, the Cirrus manual, as Bob had mentioned. It, it gives you a depiction, a formula of sorts, of how to get the airplane in the proper attitude, the proper energy state, so that you can have a successful outcome on the landing. It's got a chart in there that, that talks about each of the various model families of the Cirruses, uh, the power settings, and it's showing you the results and airspeeds that are gonna come from that. So predictability of your airplane is very key to having a successful outcome. Um, in your instrument training, we call that the performance and control method of, uh, of, of managing your airplane. You do something, you set it up in a certain way, you can predict what the airplane's going to do. So there's no guessing. If you go to the next one, please. This is a similar chart. This is a typical Cessna 172 setup for a pattern. And again, it, it provides consistency. If you follow this template, with, whether it's a Cessna or a, a Beach or uh, any other manufacturer, this will work and it's coming from the manufacturer, from their, their POH. And consistency is the key thing for success. It's one of the things that we as instructors look for before we sign someone off for solo. We want to see that they can consistently set the airplane up, ensure it is stabilized on final approach, and the pilot can make the proper kind of decisions to continue or not continue that landing process. And deciding not to continue a landing process is something that takes some practice, and we'll talk about that. Okay, next please. Now, there are a number of things that can mess this up for you, that can destabilize your approach, and it makes for a bad day. So the first is an improper power setting. If you don't have your power set properly, you'll probably be, if it's too high, you're gonna be too fast, you're gonna be too high, and you're gonna be way behind the airplane. If you've got it too low, then you're gonna have some other problems. You're gonna be low and slow and very ugly things can happen. So these are the things that, that have to be, be become pretty much rote. And um, as you make your decisions, as you're coming into the pattern or you're starting an approach, an instrument approach, you've got those power settings set so that you can have the proper speed and your predicted speed. Excessive speed and excessive altitude are very detrimental and pretty much antithetical to uh, a stabilized approach. Now they put in maneuvering here as well. What does that have to do th with this? Well, it has to do with upsetting the process that you have, whether it's in the pattern or on that instrument approach. So I was flying a couple of days ago. There, there are so few airplanes at the air at Leesburg, there are birds everywhere. So if you have to maneuver the plane to avoid the birds, and there are a lot of them at Leesburg from time to time, it's now at a possibility that it could de destabilize your approach if you've forgotten to do something and you've taken your mind off that whole process. Next, please. Always keep in mind that the wind will change. It's almost a guarantee from when you come from in route altitudes down to pattern altitude, and then in the pattern and down on your approach path. The direction, the speed will change. So you have to be ready for that. And that can destabilize you. It's, in my experience, it's not uncommon if you have 25 knots of wind at pattern altitude as you come down the final approach path, it may diminish down to 10. So you have to be ready for that. Wake turbulence, maybe you're uh, following a bigger aircraft and that can help destabilize you as well. Now, another thing that can happen is if you are uh, at a towered airport and you get this call, you're on downwind and you get a call from the tower that says, uh, Cessna 1234, can you make short approach? I've got an inbound citation six miles out. And you have to think about that. Do I really want to make that short approach? That's now going to destabilize me. I have to make different decisions 
and I'm going to be rushing this thing through. Um, that actually happened on, I'm aware of, a, uh, on a check ride where uh, an individual was asked if they wanted to do a short approach and it was a private check ride and they said yes and it destabilized it. It ended up being a poor landing and also a poor check ride outcome. Okay, um, I'll also make a couple other notes so, uh, given some check ride experience. Um, over the last couple of years, I've had a couple check rides where the applicants landings were not great. They weren't able to make their short field uh, landing points and their soft fields were not exactly soft. And the common thing that they had in, in, in those approach setups is that they were always high on final. And in the debrief, I asked the individuals separately, obviously, uh, why are you high on final? That was something I saw consistently on your landings. And one individual said, well, my instructor taught me to do that. Always be high just in case the, the engine fails. I can get to the runway. Well, I think that's an old wives tale. Uh, maybe for the one in 10,000 times that your engine's going to fail, you'll be higher and you'll get back to the runway. But for all the other chances, uh, that you're going to do your, your landing, your 9,999 times, you're going to screw up your landings. So don't be high. Another individual said, well, I just feel safer being high. Well, okay, but you've got to get down. What goes up must come down. You've got to be low enough to have a proper energy state so that you can land the airplane. Uh, speaking of that, let's go to the next slide. Now, this is an interesting uh, piece of information that I, I got from one of the FAA's, uh, whoops, let's see if that shows there, yeah. That's a, a, a flyer that they have on stabilized approach. And it's a piece of information that they shared from some study work that they had done that it says the probability of being unstable can double if you fly above a standard approach path. And the standard approach path is what we call the three to one descent profile. That means for every three miles you fly forward, you descend a thousand feet. And that usually results in about a three degree glide slope, what we use on an instrument approach. Now, flying that above that three to one path, you wanna feel safe so you fly higher and you get unstable, it results in much higher descent rates and higher approach speeds, which usually turn into a bounce, uh, a balloon, a porpoise, or a wheelbarrow. And it's all about energy management. In that higher approach that you had, you had a lot more potential energy that you had to bleed off and manage since it got converted to kinetic energy, your speed, and everything is thrown out of whack. So. Don't, don't artificially increase your altitude unless there's an, a really good reason for it. Stay on your glide path, your glide slope, whether it's electronic or visual, and you'll have a much better outcome at the end. Okay, next. All right, uh, this is the last piece I have, and then I'll turn it over to Bob. Now, us pilots, we, we like to think of ourselves as very skilled, we're competent, we know how to get the job done, and we're gonna make that landing the first time. Doesn't always have to be that way. You have to apply your aeronautical decision-making when you're in your final approach segment, whether it's on that instrument approach or it's in the pattern. You can't yield to pressure of the controller saying, hey, give me a short approach. I need to stick you in before the citation comes in. You can't, fixate on landing that says, I'm gonna land this airplane come hell or high water. And I've had an individual or two do that on check rides. They decide to land regardless of the traffic, regardless of the wind, and it usually doesn't come out well. And you don't wanna to try to save a stabilized approach. Just go around. Yeah, it might cost you a, a couple tenths on the hobs, but it's a lot cheaper than fixing a, a bent firewall or a broken landing gear. So with that, I'll turn it over to Bob. Hey, thanks, Tom. Uh, I just wanted to say one thing quickly, uh, talk about John a little bit. It's been great having John at Leesburg. 
I found out the other day, I asked him, uh, I think he celebrated his third year anniversary as a DPE, and he's done over 400 um, check rides in those three years, which is uh, a tribute to him spending a lot of time doing it, but also has 400 new pilots uh, in the organization. So Leesburg's a busy place, and the instructors there have been have been busy, but it's just been great having him at Leesburg. Uh, we have other DPEs that have to travel. Uh, it makes it a little bit more difficult for them, and we were without a DPE for probably five years. So it's it's really nice, and we appreciate all you do, John. John is uh, legendary for his orals. Um, some very extensive, but in, in fact, they're very thorough. Nobody really complains. Um, and he just shows that he cares and he does a really good job. So thanks, John, for that. Um, the, the other thing um, before going on, too, is just to mention uh, Christian Gabe. Um, it's just amazing, I think, what they've done with the Smokehouse Pilots Club with the number of members that they have now and being able to recruit as many people as they did for this um, this uh, wings thing tonight. And they have both become um, uh, wings representatives for the uh, Washington Fisdo, which I think is terrific. So um, Chris is the IT wizard. So um, with that, if you want to go ahead and change the slide. Um, yeah, CFIs uh, can be part of the problem. Um, one of the things that's it's real easy to do for a CFI is things aren't going so good. Uh, Power's going back and forth, going back and forth across the runway, and you know it's not going to be good. And so it's real easy to just say to take it, but it's not in the student's best interest to do that. I mean, there there may be times when the student when it's maybe too much for them, but I'm going to say 90% of the time you want to let the student um, make the approach, coach him through it. It gets better and better every time, and. Um, let the student make the decision to go around. Sometimes they need a little coaching to go around because, uh, you know, as, as uh, John was talking about, it's, uh, it's hard to say unable um, and they're going to try. But the, the more you impress upon them the importance of it, I think the more it sinks in and when they're flying by themselves, they're not going to try and do a, an approach or a landing that could be trouble. Um, <clears throat> it, could, it could send a bad message. Um, I'm going to go ahead to the next slide. This is sort of a review. Generally on an instrument approach, we say by the final approach fix, which is usually 1,500 feet, you're stabilized, but, but 1,000 feet is, is the guidelines for the FAA, where you're in the landing configuration, you've got the right power. Um, and power, to me, is a key. Every airplane has a power setting uh, in a Cirrus. Uh, 18 inches in a 22 will give you 120 knots for holding in any 22. 12 inches on final with half flaps, you're not chasing the power. It's going to give you 100 knots if you're on, you know, holding the glide path. So, so many things you can do with the plane that makes your job a lot easier um, and you're not uh, chasing power. I know you're, when you're on a commercial airline and you're coming in, you can tell if that pilot knows the airplane because the power is not moving. Somebody that's new in the airplane, they're slow, they're fast, they're slow, they're fast, they don't, they don't know where to set the throttle. But it's just a huge um, benefit and it just makes your job easier. Um, so when do we, uh, of course, when we can't make the landing if the runway's out of service or there's traffic on the runway, that's an obvious one. Um, John, every once in a while, um, finds a deer on the runway for a short field landing on the first try if it's not going too good because he has to do a go around. But they got to get it the next time if it looks like it might. And it's not that they missed it, but it's just um, playing playing the game. Um, and make the decision early. I'm, I'm going to give an example that just happened um, in the last uh, couple of weeks of one of my instrument students was out by himself. And it was, it was a little windy and a little uh, bumpy and he was coming in to land. Um, knowing it was, it was a little difficult, he wasn't very stable. He got all the way to touchdown and he was a little fast, added a little extra for the, for the winds, I guess. Um, and he bounced. And uh, there's a pretty strong crosswind from the left. The airplane was kind of moving to the left and when he, when he bounced, he realized that he didn't want to save it because he was going left. So then he decided to go around 
added full power, of course, the airplane's already going to the left, the torque pulls it to the left, he's high angle of attack, he's right off the runway, and he finds himself inches above the, um, the side lights on the, the taxi, or the runway lights on the left side. So it scared him a little bit, a lot, and he uh, came back and said, you know, I really need to get some more practice. I've been doing too much instrument work, and I need to get back to the basics on some of these crosswinds. So it made a good decision, but, um, you know, and, and to get the extra training was good, and his, he's got that situation fixed. But early decision is better. Uh, the earlier, the better. If you wait to the last minute, it can get you can get in trouble a lot quicker. Um, next one, next slide, if you could, uh, Chris. Yeah, basically, we've we said this. Um, whenever, um, whenever um, conditions aren't satisfactory, you're not stable. The power is not set, and, and I can't stress power enough. Um, people will be a little bit slow, and they'll add too much power, and then all of a sudden they're fast, and it. It just complicates it. If the power set, it's just something you don't have to worry about. All changes are small. You know, if you're if you're a couple of knots off, a small change before you get, you know, more knots off. So, um, another quick story. Um, another IFR student coming back in the weather, 500 feet, fairly new IFR, forgets to go um, at the final approach fix before the final approach fix to approach mode, finds himself coming into Leesburg on one seven with 500 overcast and all of a sudden he's still at 3000 feet IFR over the final approach fix. Well, he probably could have saved it, but you know, he would have been on a six degree glide path at that point versus a three, but made the right decision, admitted to uh, Potomac, hey, I screwed up. No problem. You know, he, he admitted he made a mistake. He went around and everything was fine. But he could have tried to save a bad approach in the weather and it, it could have been a lot of trouble. Um, next one. Priorities, are like in any flying, the first thing you want to do is aviate. Fly the airplane. Um, uh, any, any CFI, uh, yeah, we're still on fly the airplane. Uh, rest your descent, add power slow. You don't have to jam the power in because it's going to give you a lot of torque, but smooth, smooth power changes. Um, fly the airplane. Don't worry about talking to anybody. Don't worry about anything, but fly the airplane, get it under complete control. And next, aviate, navigate. And next slide. Um, where are you going? If it's a missed approach, have that missed approach procedure already brief before you go. You, you're planning a missed approach for every approach. So you have the missed approach procedure briefed. You have the altitude brief. You have the frequencies loaded. You're all set. It makes makes things easy. VFR back over to the tower, you know, and um, get re-enter the, the pattern, re-enter downwind. And lastly, uh, communicate. Let people know what you're doing. But everybody seems, a lot of times, seems to be in a rush to want to tell somebody right away what's going on and it's distracting. You want to avoid distractions, but just tell them your intentions. And, you know, the important thing is fly that airplane. Um, priorities, um, pretty much talked about that. Uh, IFR, talk to the tower, let them know, back over to approach control. And um, what are your intentions? Now, are you going to do another approach? Or are you going to divert someplace? Um, and for the tower, again, that you want to re-enter the pattern. Um, so, but the main thing is, is uh, always be in charge of the airplane, flying the airplane. Um, automation. Next slide. Some of the new planes are, it's great. We've got um, traffic, terrain, obstacles, weather. We've got autopilots like the GFZ 700 that'll do everything for you. And it's nice. Your situational awareness is unbelievable. You can uh, let you can have the autopilot on and um, really be relaxed. But at the same time, if you rely on that autopilot too much, and that's all you do, um, you can you can fastly lose your your um, piloting skills, your hand flying skills. And there could come a time when you're not going to have that autopilot. So I know um, for any um, IPCs or um, check rides that are transition training or any of the SEERS training, we always throw in some hand flying approaches 
um, just to make sure that people, you know, continue to have that skill. It's great to, um, you know, to I see so many people that once they start hand flying, they forget how to trim and they're, you know, they're shaking their arm because they're, they've got a cramp in their arm and uh, they've got pressure on the stick. But, you know, trimming that, trimming things off, getting the right power setting, um, small control movements, it just makes your job so much easier and it's so much more fun. And it, I like to see a smile come to people's faces when they take their hand off the stick and the plane just stays right where it is and it doesn't move. Um, that's the way to fly. Bob, I'll just add one additional thing. And I think okay. you mentioned it. Um, one thing I see on instrument candidates on instrument check rides, one skill that goes downhill a lot is landing because everybody spends all their time doing procedures, they're doing in route work. The last thing that they've been doing infrequently is landing. So I encourage them, anytime you're doing your instrument training, insist to your instructor to go get some additional landings. Take a touch and go, make a landing or two extra just to keep those skills sharp. No, that's a great idea. And I think most CFIs do that. Um, but probably not enough you know, because it can go, it can leave you really quick. Um, next slide is um, tips and tricks. Oh, we're still in automation. Um, yeah, we talked about this. I think uh, you got to avoid the, the temptation to let George do it for you all the time and practice, get the trimming and the, and the small corrections. So um, next slide is tips and tricks, um, always plan for the mist. You know, every approach you should be spring loaded to, to go around if you have to, somebody might pull on the runway. We've had people land on the opposite runway when you're just about to round out. Um, that can make your day interesting. Um, have the frequencies loaded or know where you're gonna go. Manage any distractions, don't, don't, don't worry about communicating right away, but uh, have a sterile cockpit um, and practice missed approaches even when you're um i'm guilty of this um and a lot of cfis are when you're somebody's learning to solo um they're practicing for landings you want to get the landings in um so a lot of times you kind of defray practicing the missed approaches as much unless they have to do it but i think it's a good idea to just call a missed approach call a deer on the runway or something at the last minute to see how they do it you know, I've, I've seen them, you know, flaps up and the airplane sinks before they put the power in. There's a lot of things that can happen. So it's good to get the, um, the um, muscle memory down by practicing it and doing it regularly. Um, we talked about managing distractions. Um, practicing is the next one if you want to keep the slide going there. And um, seek refresher training. Um, there are a lot of people flying that don't do a lot of refresher training and you can usually tell, they usually come to you when they have an incident and they say, um, and I had one like that a month or so ago from the Richmond Fisdo where a guy out of Manassas um, went below minimums on an approach and, you know, and he just hadn't been doing any dual flying. So it, with a couple of lessons and he was back in the groove and we sent the FISDO a note saying that, you know, he got some training and they didn't pursue it. But um, in closing, um, what, I, what I would like to say is, is in tips and tricks, and I've mentioned this before, power settings are unbelievable, an unbelievable aid to make your job easy, to make you look good. Um, they really work. Um, smooth, small corrections of power, always very small. You don't never want to jam a lot of power in or pull it off but smooth corrections of power and smooth corrections of the control where you can fly a pattern when you get good and you won't see the stick move. Use of the rudder to coordinate the turns. Um, it's, a, it's a lot that a lot of people don't really coordinate their turns. And um, if you get in the habit, I mean, you have to use it on a crosswind, but use it all the time. So um, yeah, and, and know those power settings. Almost every airplane, the downwind, for example, Cirrus is, is 100, 10 knots off for the base, 10 knots off for the final. A Cessna, 85 on downwind, 75, 65. You set the power in a Cessna at 15 inches of beam, you put the flaps in, it takes care of the speed. You put in the next notch of flaps, 
So you never really have to touch the power if you have it set in the right place until you're rounding out and you just ease that little bit of power off. So be a professional pilot, be smooth, and um, it's a lot more fun, you know, and you feel good and you're safe. So that's, um, that's all I have to say. I'd like to turn it back over to Chris. I know has some, uh, some Q&A for the, for the um, wings. Um, proficiency. So I guess, Chris, are you on? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, so yeah, you're gonna, are you going to do it? Is this part of your quiz for the um, for the uh, wings credit? And then you're going to do a you're going to do a poll? Yeah, Great. give me just one second. I'm launching it right now. Um, okay. It, you guys should be able to see it right now. Um, tricky question because we only talked about instruments in VFR, but <laughs> All right, cool. We could go ahead and close. It looks like, well, no, let's keep it going. Yeah, we've got more and more coming in here. All right. Uh, all right. Yeah. John, you want to jump in there and I mean, we talked about uh, instrument and private, but obviously any VFR flying, even advanced uh, ATPs and commercial pilots um, still have to, you know, they're usually, you know, a little bit more experienced, but they still have to comply with the, with the stabilized approach. So it, it really applies to everybody. It does, um, especially if you're a commercial pilot and someone's paying you to fly them around. You want to be smooth. You want to have that mastery of the airplane, as Bob talked about, uh, knowing and predicting what the airplane's going to do with a power setting and how you're going to get it on the ground nice and smoothly. All right, their poll should be alive now. Uh, we got about 140 answers here. Yeah, 148, 51, 78% have voted. Yeah, so you, so you don't ever want to initiate a go around and then change your mind because what you've done is you've just caused a destabilized approach. You've added power, you're off your glide path, your speed's off. So if you've decided to go around, you stick with the decision and you go around. Okay, good. All right. Give me one second here and we'll do, uh, go forward there, Chris. And launching the poll now. Uh, just a few more seconds here, Bob. We got about 70% voted. Uh, we just said, 80%. I'm going to end it and I'm going to actually share this one um, because there's, there we go. Maybe demonstrate it once, but not teach. Yeah, you're just um, setting a bad example if you demonstrate. I mean, if you do, you really have to qualify, but if you demonstrate that you can save an approach, you're setting the example that he's by himself, he can do the same thing. So it better unstable approach let him make the decision to go around that's the only way they're really going to learn and they're not going to take the risk when they're by themselves of pushing it a little bit further than their capabilities are at that point in time and this is john i'll, I'll say i've had some applicants who have said to me boy I, I wish my instructor would let me fly the airplane because the instructor's always intervening doing stuff for them and that's a bad example Okay, maybe for the first several flights, they're certainly going to be helping you a lot. But if I were the student and my instructor started doing some of that, I'd slap their hand and say, okay, I'm going to continue on. Unless it gets really out of hand, you need to give me input, give me some correction. 
and then we'll go from there. Maybe, right. a better, maybe a better way to word that question would have been to how to, the flight instructor should demonstrate how to recover from unstable approaches, which, which the recovery is the go around maneuver. And I have to, um, some of you got some background noise. Go ahead and mute yourself if you let me just want to mute everybody. Uh, give me one second. And Bob, I don't want to unmute you. Okay, Bob, now unmute yourself, Bob. Got it. Okay, and then uh, Chris, you can go ahead and go to the next uh, slide. And there we go. So a few more seconds here, Bob, we're at about 60%. It's pretty, and there we go. And show us the results, Gabe. Okay. That, that we need to have 100% on that one, guys. Come on. Uh, Almost. Almost. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. And uh, it looks like in the chat, I'm trying to monitor that too. It looks like there might be someone having an issue, uh, Thomas, with can't answering the button, uh, can't submitting it. Um, we'll take a look at that, but uh, we'll make sure you're good. Uh, and then as far, then uh, go ahead, Chris. And here is the last poll for the evening. Oh, you get wings credit for a stabilized approach? That'd be good. Yeah. All right, we're at 85% voted. We're gonna go ahead and uh, keeps going up here. There's about 90%. Um, one second, Bob. And I'll go ahead and end it and we'll all share these results here. Looks pretty good. Good. All right. Okay. So I think we wanted to go into some Q and A at this point. Um, I know you're looking at all the questions there, Gabe. Yeah. So uh, uh, anything that's really appropriate to the. Um, I have one. Uh, it's if the tower gives you a landing clearance and you accept, is that runway your? Is that runway is yours? Correct. I didn't feel I didn't feel comfortable with. Give me one second. I didn't feel comfortable with that and said unable landed on an original runway that and never heard anything else about it. I guess there was uh, some traffic issues. Well, you could get a clear to land, but they might say number two. So they may clear you if you ha uh, have the, the preceding traffic in sight and they, they ascertain that there's enough uh, separation. But I, I guess I'm not quite sure what the situation is. Yeah, it looks like uh, cleared to land and accepted the clearance and then I was asked to set up for the parallel and give way to a golf stream. I didn't feel comfortable oh. with that and said unable, landed sure. the original runway and never heard anything else about it. Well, if you're not comfortable staying unable is fine, but landing on that original runway that you were lining up for is, uh, uh, not what you would want to do. You know, meet in a Gulf Stream somewhere and that won't work. Sure. All right. Uh, Chris, you got the question about yep. the GFC 700? So there was a question asking how would you use the GFC 700 or what does the GFC 700 give you when you have to execute a missed approach? Bob? Yeah, I, I can answer that one. Um, so the GFC 700 actually has a go around button. And uh, when you push the button, it, it sequences the approach to the missed approach point. It changes the whatever approach you're on, if you're on an ILS or VOR, changes it to GPS, pitches the flight director up um, seven degrees, which is a normal climb out. And then really all you have to do is add power and hit nav 
to, to make it turn. So it'll, if there's a climb to altitude before it'll turn, it'll go to that altitude and it'll turn to the next course. So it pretty much does everything for you. Um, I don't know if that answers the question. It's, it's a fabulous tool. It kind of makes your life too easy. So Bob, as a, as a follow-up question to that, uh, what do you need to do? Well, how would you advise people? Uh, what would you advise them to do to make sure that they're ready for something like that? Like always, yeah, I think always brief the missed approach. That should be part of your briefing. You have your landing, you've done your pre-landing checks, but then you also have your missed approach uh, briefing. So what are we going to do if we have to go missed? Um, and you do it every time because you don't know the weather might be fine, but there might be another reason that you have to go missed. Somebody's on the runway, whatever happens. Um, we were coming back the other night in short final. We found out that there was a Mooney that had landed um, gear up and we didn't know it. But um, so, of course, we went missed. But um, yeah, just having a plan and, and briefing it ahead of time so that when it comes, it's no surprise. You know what you're going to do. You know who you're going to talk to. You know what altitude you're going to and you know what course you're taking. And if you're going to, and then you communicate later. And if you want to hold there or you want to come back in and do that approach again, or if you want to go somewhere else, you, uh, you, you advise ATC. Uh, here's one for you, Bob. <clears throat> if approach clears you for the approach, tower clears you to land, how is how is the responsibility for the go-around approach handled? Tower can clear you to land. Towers make mistakes too. They miss things. Um, there could still be an airplane on the runway that they thought was going to get off at midfield. There's a lot of reasons. So you as the pilot in command have to make that decision. If it's not a safe landing or there's any risk involved, you just go around and you tell the tower, um, I'm going around, you know. They're not going to criticize. Nobody's ever going to criticize you for going around. A go around is always a good decision. Um, so I don't. I don't know if that answers it well enough. But but I think he, that's, he makes mistakes, and you got to watch them. So we all make mistakes. Yeah. Um, here's another one. This morning, I quickly looked over the GA uh, JSC and mentioned adding five knots to go around to go go around speed how is that done accomplished I, i'm not really sure i understand that question but um let me see when did i answer five yeah. uh, steve if you want to steve fucker if you want to uh, unmute yourself and ask that question go for it um yeah the the question is ground speed it said on the uh, on your final approach you can make adjustments with ground speed by adding five knots, and that seemed like, wow, how do you do that unless you had GPS or something? No, you don't use ground speed for anything. All approaches exactly. are flown with indicated airspeed, so I don't know where that came from. It's in there. But, uh, it's in one of their slides. may have been uh, a typo. Yeah, it, oh, it's, not, okay. it's never ground speed. Believe me, yeah. it's not ground speed. That's just wind. So okay. you're going to land into the wind. But uh, I thought it was pretty odd. Okay, yeah. thank you. And yeah, one other fact, question, what about the angle of attack instrumentation? Any viewpoints on that? Um, it's starting to go in more and more airplanes and it's a nice backup. Um, it certainly tells you, you know, when you're on speed, but um, most light airplanes is not so critical because you know your, you know what your speed should be and, and you hold your airspeed, angle of attack is going to be there. Um, it's an option on a lot of Cirruses now and it's coming on a lot of other, it's on a lot of, um, more sophisticated airplanes. Okay, I appreciate that. And final question is power and stick. Um, I've always flown power basically for altitude control and stick for speed. Is that still sort of a good approach or not? It kind of depends on your speed <laughs> you know, okay. and, your, and where you are. Yeah, a lot of times, you know, people will be slow and um, so they'll want to add power when really all, and they're high at the same time, when really all they have to do is just lower the, relax the back pressure a little bit and they'll be right on speed. Right. And, yeah. Okay, so, thank uh, you. Yeah, I would like to add one thing. The worst thing you can do um, is be fast on, on final, I think, because you're going to be long. People that try and, more accidents happen for people trying to land long and getting in a porpoise and bending their nose wheel um, so 
I see more problems with people wanting to add a little bit of speed because it's windy and they add too much and then the airplane doesn't want to stay on the ground because it's not ready to land. So up it goes and um, it, it gets you in a real unstabilized position real quick. So try and the speed is really critical. And when you get close to touchdown, you want to land just above the stall speed. Put it That's down. Good. That's so. good advice. I began my flying tail dragger in Tiger Moth and Oster Eaglet. So <laughs> I'm, I'm all about that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, good. Your turn, John. Okay. For the next question. <laughs> So the one of the questions that came from um, on the chat is how, how good of an idea is it to use the flight director when you're manually flying, as it can act as a as it can help with the approach stability. What do you guys think about that? I think it's a great idea. It helps provide fine tuning of your muscle memory. You're you're using that to control your use of the yoke for that regimen of flight for what you're trying to do, whether it's straight and level, climb or descent, and it really helps fine tune your motor control. So I'm, I'm a big advocate of that, and I do that as well uh, for my instrument students. Thanks, John. Hey, John, thank you. All right, so folks, we have a, a few more slides uh, really quick to cover on the, on the WINGS program and you know, why you should look into it a little bit more seriously and uh, participate in it. So, and, and I'll start by saying that I'm, I'm literally a, an aviation neophyte in a, in a sense. So uh, I haven't spent a lot of time flying, but to me, getting, in, getting involved with flying has always been about learning. And uh, this is interesting stuff that I found uh, that I, you know, I want to go ahead and share uh, with the community. These are some interesting statistics. So broadly, uh, a lot of you who've been around, you know that the WINGS program is, a, is aimed at keeping people proficient. Now, interestingly, uh, what they found, I mean, what we all know, I guess, is currency and proficiency results in safer and less stressful flying. Uh, I mean, we know that because the more we fly, the more comfortable we are. And you know, the regulations and the requirements change by category, class, and, and the, the maneuvers that you get to practice. But I'm so moving on now. So the Wings program was was created, uh, you know, as as basically to address specific general aviation uh, accident causal factors. I have a small uh, anecdote that I heard from someone on it. So on Smokehouse Pilots Club, uh, we have a person called Peter Horshinsky. Uh, Peter is uh, an older uh, person who retired from the FAA many years ago. And Peter has also been uh, a phenomenal mentor. And, and he's frequently on these calls and he talks a, a lot about his experiences from back in the day. So he was one of the five original people, uh, he told us, who started the WINGS program. And he's a, Peter's a pioneer on aeronautical decision making. And he's, he's done that with the FA for over 30 years. So pretty much everything on this slide is what I heard directly from him. So I'm not gonna go ahead and, and read these slides back to you, but effectively these are the things that they set out to achieve. And uh, looking at our audience today and the number of people who have joined this presentation, I'm sure Peter would have felt really happy if he had joined. Peter, Peter is still in the call right now. Oh, is uh, As a matter of fact, yes. All right, Peter, uh, I didn't realize that. Peter, you wanna say something? You can unmute yourself and, and and add in. I didn't want to plug that one in. Well, I'm very happy. Go ahead, Peter. In this kind of a program and, and the, the work that is being done right now and effectively to uh, give both Bob and John something to work with. And uh, I thank you all for uh, flying safely. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Right. And, and there have been studies which have uh, been put together to say that pilots who participate in the WINGS program and other forms of recurrent training do end up having fewer accidents and incidents than their peers. And these are some of the, the benefits uh, that have been noted down. So there are obviously insurance uh, discounts and, and the sort. Uh, there are... Uh, requirements of the, the flight review, which are satisfied by participating in the WINGS program. But overall, I think 
the reason why I do it, and I, I, I hope all of you do it, is because when we do participate in these things, we become safer pilots. So uh, the last thing on that is uh, how do you get wings credit? Uh, instructors can give wings credit. Obviously, you can go onto the onto the website and finish up courses. And if you've finished accredited activities, you can reach out to any of the FAST team representatives uh, and present them with information to assign WINGS credit as well. Uh, last plug in, uh, AOPA is currently collecting a survey on how to improve the WINGS program. Uh, I mean, as, as, a, as a pilot, more than anything else, I would say that, you know, looking at the website or trying to find the information, it, doesn't always work out the best way from the FA website, but at the same time, if you do take the time, there is there is a lot of useful information which is out there for any of us to to access and use, even in its present form. So, uh, if you do have suggestions and uh, you have thoughts, please do go to AOPA. You must have all received an email, uh, or go to the FA site, look for the survey, and uh, please do contribute. Hey, Chris, Jim, this is Perry. If I interject. Yeah, sure, Perry. Yeah, just to every, uh, for everyone's benefit, uh, this has been an ongoing thing. It's, it's been on our, uh, the radar the, of the FAA and the FAST team in particular, that that website does need to be revised and redone. Uh, it, they've been working on it for some time. It's one of the reasons why the AOPA survey has been put out to everyone. Um, again, it's, it's been on the radar for some time. We're well aware that it needs to be revised and it's in the process of being uh, worked on. So hopefully that uh, will come soon. Right. Thank you, Perry. Thanks, Perry. Hey, Krish, one, one thing for me, this is John. Uh, everybody needs to know that if you take a practical test, you can get WINGS credit for completing that practical test. Your instructor can do it for you in your behalf. We can do it as examiners, although sometimes we don't have the time to, to do that. But you get a slew of, uh, of WINGS credit for completing a practical. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, John. All right, so with that, uh, Gabe, do you have any, do you want to close the meeting? And then we can, we can open the mics after this. So if people have questions or discussions, we, we can have yeah, a so yeah, absolutely. Thanks for going through that, Chris. And I think that at this point, uh, I just want to thank Bob and, and John for taking the time to go through all of the material that you did this evening. Uh, the, the comments, the questions, um, they're still coming. So uh, this was fantastic. So thank you both again on behalf of everyone in this meeting. Uh, with that said, I think for those that need to jump, uh, feel free. Um, what Chris and I had thought was uh, perhaps we could, uh, if anybody wanted to hang around and have a little hanger talk before we all jump off, it's only about 8.30 and we're happy to hang around and anyone else that can do so, please do so. Uh, lastly, let me uh, make sure that I also mention this. During the call, I have received about 75 emails. Um, we'll make sure that all of your addresses are synced up with the, uh, the WINGS credits. So no problem there um, and continue to let me know if, um, if there's any issues, but we'll post it on Smokehouse and then also uh, let you know. But we did post the emails uh, that you can send that to uh, in the chat. With that said, Krish, um, I think that's it. All right. So, Bob, to lead this off, uh, there's a question I thought you would really enjoy answering. Uh, it just came up on the group. So the question reads, I'm a new SR20 Generation 3 Cirrus pilot. The recommended final approach speed is 78 knots, but the VSO is 60 knots. I experienced long floating times during landing and uh, doesn't seem to be easy to get the stall horn sound during my landings. What advice would you have? Okay, that's a really good question. Uh, recommended final approach speed is 78, but that's not the recommended landing speed. So that's the, the speed over the numbers. And at that point, um, the power should be coming back and um, you should be probably trimming a little bit nose up so that um, by the time you get to the touchdown point, you're going to be closer to about 62 or 63 knots. And basically the airplane lands itself. When the airplane's ready to land, you're trying to hold it in that ground effect position and the power's off. There's no more lift being generated by the prop. Plane touchdown in a nose high attitude and you have a beautiful landing. 
but you can't let you can't land fast everybody wants to a lot of people want to try and put it down fast and it's just not good if it's not ready to land if it's not close to the stall speed there's a good chance you're going to get a nice bounce and there's a good chance that could turn into a pio so pio that's a, a pilot induced oscillation um, it happens real quick <laughs> so and it can be expensive too you can all right folks we can leave the mic open if you have any other questions to ask uh, ask of bob or john uh, if you just want to check in on other things and see how everybody is doing uh we can take the time to do that hey bob uh i don't know if uh if i'm coming through can you hear me yes yeah yeah, hey, Bob, uh, this is Tom Gross. I had the question about flying the uh, missed approach with the GSC 700. I I've never actually gotten it to do that. And uh, it seems like uh, at Winchester it it is is what comes to mind. Um, I I've always had to fly those approaches, uh, missed approaches manually, because it seems like the GPS is telling me to do one thing, but I know the missed approach is telling me to do something else. And, and I... I, I uh, I, I don't quite recall it all at the moment, but I think like on 3-2, you know, it, the missed approach, as I recall, is a right turn, but it seems like the GPS is telling me to make a left turn or something to that effect. No, um, it'll sequence the approach. It doesn't activate the approach till the, the missed approach until you hit the missed approach point, um, which is the end of the runway. Um, it will, if the, auto, if the autopilot's on, it will pitch up to the flight director when you engage the autopilot, it engages it in pitch and roll mode. So it'll go to 1400 feet, but if you're not in nav mode, the only button you have to hit is nav. That way at 1400 feet, nav will make that right turn to go and intercept the back course of the localizer back out to clad. It works every time if you, if you it's a, it sounds like a buttonology yeah, issue. And yeah, some people so forget to go, a, yeah, some people forget to hit the nav button. Part of it, that's the addition. And if you don't have the, uh, the go around button, then you're doing this manually in the sense of hitting the unsuspend, the unsuspend button and uh, initiating the climb, right? Yeah, actually you're suspending the approach and uh, then it goes to the missed approach and you can do it manually. You can do it with the flight director too, if you have a flight director. If right. you know, if you did, you, yeah, you can fly it manually and it's gonna tell you when to turn and everything and the flight director will turn when you get to 1400 feet. We'll turn you. Are you but the autopilot does everything for you. Well, even There's... If without the auto, I mean, the flight director is telling us what to do. And, you know, my experience has been is I just turn off the flight director because it's too confusing and I fly it manually. So I've never quite gotten yeah, yeah. it to work. Yeah, you can't turn off the flight director if the autopilot's on. If the autopilot's on, the flight director's on. If you're flying manually, you can turn it off. Right, that's what I mean, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's one other scenario where if you don't set up the approach procedure properly and you don't intercept the final approach course with the flight plan, even though you're on an ILS, you can fly the ILS just fine, but your GPS may be stuck back at a holding fix or, or on another leg of your flight plan, and you won't be able to do a go around if the approach is not sequenced through to the missed approach point properly. So that's another scenario uh, that we didn't mention earlier. Yeah, that's true because it doesn't initiate the uh, missed approach until the missed approach point. So right. you can climb before that. But... Right. Good point. All right, thanks. Haven't seen you for a while, Tom. You still out there at Leesburg a lot? Well, I haven't been out there recently, obviously. But, yeah, <laughs> but yeah I've, I've been out there. And uh, yeah, uh, yeah exactly. um, and um, I, I missed some of the airplanes, you know. Uh, uh, there's only 182 out there now. And uh, uh, there's uh, uh, I missed the diamond for a while. I'm glad we have a, a diamond back on the line. And uh, yeah, I'm out there. Good. Good for you. Thank you. I have a question. Go ahead, Mom. I'm on. Hey, uh, my question is about the ILS approaches. Uh, in G1000, you can set vector to final, or you can uh, select an initial approach fix and, and you, where you start your approach. 
what's a better approach to go vector to final or select an initial approach fix, even though you don't know if the APC is going to send you to that I uh, initial approach fix? Um, well, sometimes you get vectors to final, so you don't have too much choice. Sometimes the initial approach fix might be way out of the way. The initial approach fix for the ILS at Leesburg is Martinsburg. So why not go direct to still? It'll still fly the approach. And it depends on what kind of vertical nav you have, but the newest vertical navs will take you all the way to the altitude at the final approach fix. You know, so th there's some different configurations. But I'm um, at the, the way I, I tend to teach it is if you're coming in and you expect that you're going to get an initial approach fix, load it with that initial approach fix. Uh, maybe ATC will come back and give you an interim fix. So maybe if they said direct, you, you load it with Martinsburg for Leesburg, and then they say direct, still, still available. It's a, act, a waypoint you can activate. Um, if you activate vectors to final, it'll draw the, the magenta line from the runway out past the uh, uh, final approach fix. You may not have, depending on the vintage of the G1000 software, you may not have access to the other waypoints. Uh, some people have said you, you always load vectors to final. Other people say you never load vectors final. It depends. If you think you're going to get a, uh, a fix, go ahead and load it. If it changes, you can just reload the approach. But if you're going to get vectors, load vectors. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, this is Joe Gooden. Um, I, I fly a lot of Garmin stuff, both G1000 and 750. Um, I, I never do vectors to final, always the approach. And then as someone just said, you know, you can sequence through that or you can actually um, take it off, uh, you know, GPS steering and, and just fly the vector and then intercept the, the final approach course. Over. So I, I have a question. Um, I was in an aviation uh, Cessna 172 on the uh, VOR Alpha in uh, runway 26 in Martinsburg. And we got cut off by another company airplane in front of us. So Tower so under air traffic control guidance. And Tower said, execute public missed approach. The timer hadn't counted down to three minutes and 40 Error seconds, and we were not at the NDA yet. But since Tower said execute a public approach, I immediately did a, uh, a nose up, full power, end up to 3000, heading back to MRB. Was that the right thing to do? Or I, I, I felt it was a safe thing to do because there was an airplane right, you know, beneath us heading for 26. Is that the right thing to do? Or um, should I have waited for the timer to count down to three minutes and 48 seconds or whatever it is on that, on the approach plate? Any comments on that? Bob, you want to take it? Well, while everyone's formulating your thoughts, it's a great meeting tonight. Uh, Kresh and uh, Gabe, you did a great job. Uh, Thanks, Mike. John, Bob, another... Another example of excellent work by both of you. I, I've got to sign off for the evening here. So, uh, again, we'll talk later. Good seeing you all tonight. Thanks, Mark. Mark. See you. Yep. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate you being here. Take care, Mark. So, Sukumar, the, the, uh, you were on the approach, and you, do, you weren't at MINS yet, and they told you to, to go missed because of traffic? Yes. So we were descending from MRB on, on heading 290. Uh, the timer was counting down. We hadn't reached the timer limit. Yep. Not down at MDA yet. My, Mike Schwartz will remember this because he was on the other airplane. Oh. <laughs> um, so anyway, they were a little slow. They were ahead of us. They were blocking our, our, our approach. And Tower said, e execute, published, missed approach. I didn't. Wait for my, my 
as soon as he said that, I just went full power and pulled up to 3,000 and headed back to the VOR. Was that the right thing to do? I mean, given that there was an airplane beneath us? Well, I think that's the only thing you can do. If the ATC gave you that directive, now, if, if ATC tells you to do something unsafe, obviously you don't do that, you're PIC. But if, if they detected a conflict, obviously you want to comply with that. Uh, often they'll come back and say approach clearance canceled and then ask you to do, and, and they explicitly tell you that you no longer are cleared to, to, to do the approach and to land. Uh, but yeah, you, you, you want to avoid that conflict. So when Tower uses the word published missed approach, what they're saying is the altitude you need to climb to and the direction and the destination you're going to, not necessarily coming down to the MDA. It sounds like they wanted you to terminate Denver, the approach right? straight away. That's the way I interpreted that. Yeah. Okay. Hey guys, this, uh, this is Dave Shikino. Yep, you were good, Dave. Bob, you're you're on mute. What have you said in the last few minutes? We didn't hear it. I'm sorry. I, I was saying that uh, a missed approach starts at the end of the runway at the missed approach point, and the reason for that is if you uh, started early, you don't have obstacle clearance. There could be obstacles off to the side. So um, by the book, it starts at the missed approach point, and that way you have obstacle clearance. So they tell you to go missed approach. The right thing to do would be to climb straight ahead until you get to the missed approach point before you turn. But if they're telling you to turn, that's a different story. If they said execute the published missed, you should go to the missed approach point before you start. And you should probably be well above the traffic that's in front of you if you're climbing. So, so it depends on how they worded it. They would, they would have to terminate, terminate you and tell you to break it off or something if there was a, a problem. Right, I've run this in my head many times this was a VOR alpha. So this was coming down to MDA with a timer running. I think it's three minutes and 48 seconds. Um, so this was not the ILS. This was not the RNAV to know the exact no. missed approach point. When Tower no. said execute published missed, I just went full throttle, no mm -hmm. stop. Yeah, the missed approach is 341. <laughs> But you would you could climb to that missed approach and then turn. But if they tell you to turn, I guess you have no choice but to turn. But that's not the proper procedure. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Now, if I had done that on an actual check ride, would that be a fail? Uh, here's the DPE. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, <laughs> All right. I mute, I mute myself. Um, if there was a conflict and I, and I, as the controller said, publish the, apply the published missed approach, you would fly it as published as Bob, Bob talked about. It's at the end of the runway, you climb, you get above the traffic if that's what's caused the issue, get to that missed approach point and then fly the remainder of the published miss. That's what we want to see. And on an instrument check ride, yes, you have to do a missed approach and fly it. Okay. This is uh, Dave. Um, I may have missed it on the presentation, but I, I didn't see, um, you know, part of stability is definitely, you know, if you got like a, you know, if you're working with your student you know, as an instructor, especially working with a student, uh, you want to maintain a good sterile cockpit, especially on the approach, um, you know, in a sense that if someone's talking, um, you know, or even if they're rebriefing something at a critical phase of flight, um, you know, you definitely want to, you know, voice up and say be quiet if you're the student and the instructor's talking or if you're the instructor and the student's talking don't be afraid to say you know shut up <laughs> it's just my thoughts yep. you don't need distractions usually enough distractions whether it's birds or airplanes coming on the other end of the runway absolutely thanks dave Well, we've got it uh, basically opened up. I don't see any questions here in the uh, the chat. Um, so, if anybody has anything they want to share, now is the time to do it. How are you guys doing? How's everyone holding up? Good. Yes, I, want to, I want to thank you guys for this great session. So this is really, really great.
and uh, I wish to continue, okay? <laughs> Thank you. Hey, there's more where that are, comes from, Ahmed. <laughs> yeah, these are crazy times that we're in, and, and these Zoom meetings are basically the only social contact I have, so I thank you all for, uh, for this. <laughs> That's awesome. Thanks for joining, absolutely. And I hope you enjoyed I, the donuts. Yeah, those were good. <laughs> Well, I didn't, uh, that was not on the approved list of slides, John. <laughs> okay, I'll take a hit for that. <laughs> it's, it, it's, really, it's, it's really been great, though, because, you know, I was looking at the past few um, events. I mean, I think at this point we've held almost eight different Zoom meetings, but who here still on the meeting feels like they already live on Zoom these days outside of these meetings? <laughs> yeah. So bad at all. At all. So, so yeah. I, we, we totally understand that uh, it, it takes a lot of time and effort for you to still be here tonight. So I uh, really appreciate that. Um, I know I live my life on Zoom right now, but uh, it's just our life at this point. So I just wanted to say thank you. I, I think it's great that all of you are still here um, and the fact that we all want to learn together. And it's interesting. I, I, I think it'll be even when we are back to being around each other and having normal flyouts, which I can't wait to do. How are we going to leverage Zoom to continue to learn in between those meetings, right? So uh, that's what I'm looking forward to. But um, enough of my rant on that. <laughs> hey, Chris, if you leave full screen mode or screen sharing, does that help us see the gallery view? Yeah, maybe. You should have, uh, I should have thought of that earlier, Ryan. Because <laughs> I can only see about three people, and it's like, hey, where is everybody? Hold on. Hold on. Uh, there yeah, there was yeah, a, it does. That's pretty cool. Yeah, there was about 11 pages of uh, people's um, profile pictures there. So uh, at one point, I would share that we had almost 240 people in the meeting. Um, that's the largest one we've ran so far, uh, which is pretty cool. And by the way, if uh, anyone is on this call still, whether you're on Zoom or Facebook, um, I'm not sure how you learned of this meeting. Maybe it was through the FAA, but um, I encourage you to sign up at this, on the Smokehouse Pilots um, page to get those email uh, notifications in the future as well. All right. Cool. Anything else from anybody that they'd like to share? If not, we might be able to wrap it up. Yeah. Can I ask a quick question? Go uh, ahead. Yeah, my name is Ryan McCann. Thanks very much for putting this on. This is my first time joining on uh, the, uh, this, this group. Um, and thanks, Bob and John. Um, I'm a pre-solo private pilot, and I'm training in the 172. And uh, I've always kind of wondered how, um, you know, on late final, I usually put in the last notch of flaps and have to put in power. And I've always kind of wondered how that uh, change in configuration uh, fits the philosophy of the stabilized approach. And um, am I doing something wrong if I'm having to add power? and all the drag that's introduced. Go for it, Bob. Um, yeah, I, I would say if you have the right power setting in a 172, it's usually around 15 inches and you play the flaps, you know, as needed, the final notch of flaps should be slowing you from that um, 65 knot final to a, a touchdown speed uh, so you shouldn't, if you add power, you're also adding lift because the prop blows air over the wings. So it makes it a little bit unstable. If you can avoid doing that, maybe you're putting the flaps down too early or maybe you don't have enough power, add a little bit of power and you shouldn't have to add power. It should be at the very end, just easing the power off and just letting the airplane settle down and bring a smile to your face when you're not sure if you're on the ground yet or not. Chris gets that smile all the time. Uh, yeah, that's right. I got it once and then uh, Bob said, show me that landing again. And I'm still searching for it. <laughs> <laughs> the next one is definitely a go around. Hey, Johnny, I see your question here. Whatever happened to that old Aerostar that some group is getting ready to fly out? Uh, the one that's sinking into the tarmac at the parking space. I don't know. Uh, anybody know about that? It's still there. <laughs> um, it's involved in legal discussions with the town of Leesburg. Gotcha. That's all I'll say. Uh, Lucy, did I see you were getting ready? If you're still here, I look like you were getting ready to jump in on the conversation, but I don't see if you're still here or not. Uh, and by the way, if there's, if you didn't realize or not, but um, if you 
click on somebody's um, square box, you can actually hide the um, non-video participants so that you get a really full screen of where everybody's at. I don't know if you guys know that trick or not. But, um, hey, this, is, uh, this is Bob Fecto. I'm uh, hailing from North Carolina. John Somiak, about a year and a half ago, uh, checked me out and I got my uh, private pilot's license. And I want to update you, John. Uh, I had uh, the XP-172 in last August. I was flying it back for maintenance to Warrington and uh, we had an engine out failure at 10,000 feet. Oh. I got to park my plane in John Grissom's front yard. Really? But I, yeah, one of the things I really uh, wanted to thank you for was, you know, we worked a little bit on those soft field landings. And the ultimate soft field landing is when you have to land in a field. But for the whole group here, you know, those emergency procedures we train on, they're no joke. If you follow the procedure, you will be okay. If you don't, you won't be. And uh, the other thing is in August in Virginia, everything is a grass strip. So if they start vectoring you for a grass strip, it's really hard to find them. I can tell you that. No matter, even if you know where it is, it's still hard to find them. But uh, Mr. Somiak, I owe you a great debt of gratitude. So thank you very much. Well, I'm glad it worked out. Good. Question. Well, that is a phenomenal story. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, so uh, yes. we, we were talking about um, establishing a, um, a stabilized approach as far out as the final approach fix. When I was going through my instrument training, um, one of the strategies that I was taught was uh, dive and drive, uh, getting down to MDA uh, as soon as possible after the final approach fix so that you can, you know, you'll have more time to develop your final approach fix from MDA. And actually I did that on my check ride with John and I thought he's, I thought he thought that was okay. So uh, I'm just curious uh, if there's been new thoughts on it or, Well, Jim, I'll just say that uh, we don't judge technique on the check rides. We, we look at the result. We need to make sure that the result is what we're expected. If, if you had pointed the nose straight down and gotten unstabilized trying to do that final segment, I probably not would have approved you. Uh, and I've had some people do that. Uh, yes, drive and, dive and drive is still used by a lot of people and it's gotta be done safely. It's gotta be done in a manner that you keep the airplane stabilized and in a position to make a landing. So um, some people do not like to do dive and drive. They use a constant descent profile and that is now allowed, formally allowed in the instrument rating uh, ACS. It, it, you, it, before last year, it was not actually mentioned but a constant angle descent is now uh, 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 approved and, and looked for. All right, everyone. Uh, anything else anyone wants to add or share? We've got about four minutes left. Want to be respectful right, of everyone's Ryan. time. Ryan, go for it, man. Um. I'm not quite done with private. I hope I'm done here in a couple of weeks. We're getting ready to start some progress again. So forgive me if this is ignorant, um, kind of towards John, but Bob, if you want to hop in, if I understand right, and I'm thinking a little bit ahead, um, in instrument training, we really focus on um, straight in approaches and you have a long time to get stabilized, usually only on a single heading or very minimal variance of um, headings. Why don't we in private training um, teach, spend more time teaching straight ins and uh, why is so much emphasis on pattern work if uh, we have to do different things once we get to uh, instrument phase? Well, I'll take the first crack and then I'll let Bob comment. Uh, the assumption is in VFR pilot, your duties are you're going to an airport, you enter the pattern in a normal fashion. Uh, we do teach, I teach straight in approaches for private pilots because you may get that at a tower controlled airport. But uh, the predominant 
entry that you're going to be doing is a pattern and we want you to be proficient and uh, adept at doing that but if you have to do a, a base entry or a straight in entry we you should be instructed on that as well I, I agree with that um, I think the the visual pattern is the most efficient way to get in but people don't practice enough doing straight ins and most people don't have the right glide path don't you know they don't bring their power back then they find themselves fast so what you're saying we probably do need to do more practice with that because a lot of times you do get assigned to straight in yeah. and um, a lot of um, not really experienced private pilots will maybe struggle with that a little bit and you know end up being high or fast or because they're not used to doing it it's not it's not the standard thing you know a b c d it's new so a lot of judgment comes in and, um, you know, when you're changing to a straight in approach and yeah, that is mostly what you do on instruments, but they're, they're longer straight ins. you may get a three mile straight in on a visual or something. So good point. Thanks Ryan for bringing that up. Anyone else have anything before we close out here? If I may share one thing, uh, one of the things I learned from a senior instructor was don't apply flaps in a bank. Um, so straighten out and then apply flaps. The airflow is complicated enough when you're in a turn uh, and apply flaps when you're straightened out. Do you agree with that? It seems to make sense and I've been practicing it ever since. Bob? Um, that's the standard way of when you roll out, say on base leg, put the flaps down. Of course, a straight end, you're going to be straight. It really doesn't do any harm to put them down in a turn. You're getting equal amounts of lift off of each flap. And it, sometimes you may need to, you know, you're high, you know, you're going to need to slow down. So why not put the flaps in full flaps early, <clears throat> even though you're still in a turn, because that's going to give you some drag. I mean, um, there's, yeah, there's a lot of different situations. So sometimes it's not the standard way of doing it, but it's not bad to do it. And if you're, if you like doing it straight and level, that's the safest way. Yeah. So for, for low time pilot, new, uh, in training pilot, new pilot, uh, do it in while you're straight and level, takes some of the complications out, but, uh, thereafter, as you have more mastery of the airplane, certainly it's, it's usually not a big deal. It. Chris, what do you think, buddy? Well, I think I'm good, man. This is great. So everyone, thank you for joining. Uh, you know, we had great attendance, not just from Smokehouse, but also from beyond. And uh, Gabe has been sleepless with all the pings he's been receiving and all the emails and everything else. So Gabe, thank you. Thank and you, Gabe. Bob and John, uh, what can I say? I'm in a, I'm, I learn something every time I run into you guys. So thank you for taking the time to do this. Yeah, thank you both. It's awesome. Hey, and uh, yeah, thank you so much, Bob and John. Uh, and thank you for everyone attending. Chris, it's been great working with you on this project and I can't wait to do another one. Um, there is an event coming up on the Tuesday, next Tuesday, which is another, um, I think it's uh, Cessna, Piper and Beechcraft, but it's totally, you know, independent Smokehouse event. Um, and they wanted to come, you know, speak with anybody, with us. So if you want to jump on that, that'd be great. Um, and maybe next, next week we'll t change it up a little bit towards the end of the week and throw a, a virtual happy hour versus all these training issues that we're, uh, <laughs> these sessions we're doing, but uh, which are fantastic. But um, I know everybody loves to do that too. So if that sounds interesting, um, you might see that pop up. But thanks again for everyone uh, who joined tonight. It's always a great pleasure seeing everybody. Have a good evening. Yep. We'll talk to everybody soon. Okay. Take care. See you.